So when Dad was hired in 1978, um, he, he volunteered for two or three years prior, um, and then he retired in 2006, about 20 and a half years on. Then in 2012, November, he came down with the esophageal cancer. He had been having issues swallowing uh, for a few weeks, a month or two, and then decided to go get an endoscopy so they could investigate, see what was going on. Uh, after the endoscopy, the doctor, he was in a recovery room, the doctor came back and said, you know, I've got some concerns, we see something there, we're not sure what it is, so we're going to send it away and uh, do some tests, whatever. And uh, they said it could be cancer, and that was just, you know, out of left field for me. My dad responded to the news probably better than anyone else, um, which was kind of weird, I thought. But at the same time, I think he was trying to protect the family by not, I mean, obviously he was upset, but he wasn't, he didn't show it like everyone else did. I think he, his goal was, okay, well, this is just something we're going to have to, uh, just a hurdle to jump over, something we're going to have to deal with. And that, that's truly was his mindset. Uh, was he upset? Absolutely. Was he scared? Absolutely. But he also knew he had to do everything he could in his power to stick around for a while. And I always thought throughout, uh, if anyone can, can beat it, it would be my dad. Uh, It started with a elevated PSA at my annual physical, and that was in 2011. Now, prostate cancer is a slow-growing cancer, and a PSA test is not an absolute proof that you have cancer, but it's just an indication. So the doctor at OHC said, let's watch this and see what it does next year. Next year, it went up again, um, higher than normal. So at that point, the doctor recommended that I go see a urologist. I was diagnosed with cancer two years ago. Um, I had a mass in my neck. Uh, I went to my regular physician, and he just thought I had, because I had sinus infections, he just thought it was a blocked duct. So he gave me some medication, sent me home. For a couple months, I went back, and I still had it. So he referred me to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. And when I finally got the appointment to go there, when I went in, I was not thinking that uh, he would say that I w it looks like you have cancer. I just thought he was going to say that, yeah, you just have a blocked duct or something. So as soon as I walked in, he said, that's not a blocked duct. My dad kind of downplayed it, I think, because that's the kind of person he is. And also, he didn't want us to get freaked out and uh, super worried. He's just like, yeah, it's a cancer, you know, we're going to... We know who the doctors to see. We're going to go talk to them tomorrow or whenever, in the coming days and figure out a game plan, figure out how we're going to attack it. And he just said, you're a firefighter. More than likely, that mass in your neck is cancer. That was it. I didn't, I, I never really thought about cancer, to be honest with you, other than it was a word in the firehouse we just kind of just ignored. Everybody thinks they're they're not going to ever get it. It's not going to happen to me. You know, prostate cancer, if they catch it early, is uh, pretty curable. Uh, however, you know, what if they didn't catch it in time? I, I was thinking about, you know, if it has spread outside of the capsule, uh, got into the lymph nodes, got into the bones, got into the other organs, that'd be a whole different story. And then I'd be going through radiation, chemo, and a lot of other treatments. It was uh, more than a shock. <laughs> I was, uh, I, 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 I think I just completely shut down. I, I, um, I didn't know what to think. Um, there's a million things that, that run through your head, you know, uh, how you live your life, whether you're going to live, whether you're not going to live. There's just a, a lot of things. And I just, I just couldn't get any thoughts together at the time. Uh. I mean, he, he put forth the effort as much as you can expect from anyone. And, and we all saw that, and we knew. We knew he was doing everything he could, but still, I mean, when you see how it's, it's uh, taking a toll on his body, it's just, 
it's, it's hard. It's very hard. I mean, I, I don't wish that upon anyone because it, it truly does just, it hurts the whole family. Well, the treatment process was I had the one surgery, then I had another surgery to remove my tonsil. Um, and at 52 years old, getting your tonsil out is quite an experience. He had uh, radiation, chemotherapy, numerous, numerous times. He had surgery. I mean, every every treatment they threw at him, he opened. You know, he opened his arms to, and uh, just unfortunately, it's just one of those things you have no control over. I mean, he did everything the doctors told him to do. He did it, and he was he didn't w always want to, but he knew that's what he had to do to be there for his family and uh, try to get better. And then. Uh, about a month and a half later after he was sure that I had healed and my blood cell count had come back up, they started radiation. Um, five days a week for six weeks. Um, in the first week, it, and it, it, it was not bad at all. It was, um, I thought, well, this is gonna be a cakewalk. The second week, I, st I started to <clears throat> lose taste. My mouth would burn, my throat was sore. Um, by week three, my energy was starting to be sapped. Um, I was losing my appetite to the point where I was dropping pounds rapidly, to the point where I had two weeks left of treatment and if I didn't force myself to eat, they were gonna put a feeding tube in my stomach. Uh, the treatment, I can tell you, I've gotten through it, but it hasn't been that pleasant. Uh, there's still some side effects I'm dealing with. They should go away over time, uh, but it's a life-changing experience. And even I'm cancer-free now for close to two years, almost two years, and the fear doesn't leave you. I mean, you still, I still have to go to appointments and every time I go, the night before I go, or a couple days before I go, I, that's all I think about. Never doubted that he'd be able to go through with all the treatments and he would complete everything he had to do. And everyone says, you know, he had to fight. And I mean, there's no doubt that he was gonna fight with everything he had. And um, just unfortunately, things progressed and um, just, just got worse over time, so. I've had a lot of support from my uh, friends in the department, uh, they've reached out, you know, offered to help in any way. I'm stubborn and strong, so I didn't accept a lot of that help, but uh, yeah, the guys were there for me. And, and girls, they were all there for me and uh, helped me out a lot. I think the one thing that kind of pulled us all through is that we do have a very close-knit family. So whether it's me, my mom, my brother, my sister, everyone was kind of around to help out and uh, try to stay upbeat about the whole situation even though we didn't know what was going to happen. We knew that it was a terrible disease and if you, if you do the research then you'll see that the outcome is usually not very good. So we knew it was important to stay upbeat and help help my dad do anything anything we could that would help him stay positive. Coming to work every day was probably the best thing for me because I was able to be around the people basically that I grew up with. You know, the department is, I came on the job very young and so basically it's the people that understand each other. It's really been great to get back to the field and uh, to start running the calls again and to helping people and to see all the, the guys and girls and talk to them and everybody's asking how I'm doing and and all that, and you know, everybody's telling me I look good, which I don't know about that. But uh, no, I feel like I've, uh, I've been working out hard and trying to get myself back into shape and thinking about taking care of myself better and you know, what I can do to you know, make my retirement a lengthy one. We can look at the past and we can see all the, the injuries, the health concerns that the people who mentored me have, the people that have died. We have to learn from that. And the culture of, of this department has to change from now going forward in the future or 
it's not gonna, we're not gonna change anything. We're gonna still lose the same amount of people. This is a, a profession that is high risk as it is. So the mentors that, ha that come today need to make sure that we teach the youth of the department today that we have to take better care of ourselves. When I was in rookie school, we burned diesel fuel in the burn building, the old burn building. Um, and we, we, when we came out of there, we were covered with black soot. Uh, you know, we were wearing SCBA, of course, but we were just covered with black soot, and you had to scrub for hours to get it off. Uh, and of course, we didn't take a shower right away. We still had the rest of the day and several more fires to go through. So, you know, this soot had plenty of time to absorb through the skin. Uh, another thing we did was the pit fires up on the hill here at the academy and we don't even know what we were dumping into those pits. It was donated 55 gallon drums of flammable liquids, anything from gasoline, kerosene, paint thinners. It burned like crazy and we didn't wear SCBA. Every single time that we go out into a building, whether it's smoke filled, whether it's fire, it's all um, it's, it's all in, in saturating our clothing, it's saturating our skin. Um, it, we just need to understand that we need be, to be better at taking care of our gear. And, and no one wants to hear that really. I didn't want to hear it when I was younger. But we just need to understand it, it is imperative that we keep our gear clean, that we shower immediately once we get back and with that rig is ready to go for the next call, we, part of getting ourselves ready for the next call is getting ourselves ready. That means showering, change clothes, um, wash, our, wash the clothes that we wear and make sure that we take care of our gear properly. We need to wear our SCBA all the time, every fire, food on the stove, um, car fires, dumpster fires, just any, any time there's any smoke, you need to put that on and then you need to leave it on throughout overhaul. Just there's, there's no excuse not to do that stuff because why don't you want to put your mask on because it's going to take you 10 seconds? I mean, you know, or, or just because you think it's cool? Well, it's not cool to have cancer. I just want to tell you all, it's not acceptable to be the cowboy anymore to not wear your SCBA. Um, older guys that have been doing it for years and you're still healthy and you know you still still look like the, the tough guy think about the effect you're having on the rookie firefighter behind you he sees what you're doing and he's gonna do the same thing throughout his career well my dad's message would be uh, especially to the younger members is to take care of yourself to work out every day to, to wear your face piece to, to plug the ply events in to, to not wear your, your gear in the stations to fill out exposure reports all the little things like that that really none of those things take more than 30 seconds the nature of what we do in the fire services is we help others um, we, we pretty much mostly are type a positive people we, not negative um, so I have a great support network around me from the fire department, my home life, my family, my friends, everything. So I'm able to stay positive, which is the, one of the most important things to beating this disease. I had some friends that I could talk to. And since I've been part of health and safety, I had some friends there that I could talk to. And I kind of knew my way around the system. But for somebody that's not aware of what they need to do, to file a workers' comp claim, um, you know, what, what doctors to see and that kind of thing. It'd be great if we have a group of people that have been through situations like I've been through. Guys and gals need immediate support from people that they can relate to. Um, when we deal with outside, we're dealing with emails, sometimes members from other departments or other retired members from other jurisdictions, they have lives. Sometimes it takes a while for them to get back. So if we had a support network in this department, among our own peers, our own members, it would be a lot better off. 
I think it's important that we educate our members to you know, think about what could happen in the future. Um, I have to admit, I didn't start thinking about retirement until I got fairly close to it. I wish I would have started planning that sooner. And I certainly didn't think about having cancer um, before it happened to me. I mean, some things you just can't prevent. And uh, to be prepared as you can, prepare yourself as best as you can to, to fight those diseases off and keep them away from you. Because the, the little things that you don't do eventually will add up and, uh, and hopefully not, but I mean, they can lead to some serious diseases and cancers. We all have to be responsible for taking care of ourselves and doing the right thing. Um, don't rely on your officer to tell you to put on your mask when you go in for that food on the stove. Do it for yourself, do it for your family, do it for your kids. Um, you know, this, this may prevent you from going through what I've gone through. Cancer is a real issue that affects all of us. So talk about it. Um, understand that we can beat the disease. It's not gonna take all of us. And the more that we talk, eventually they will find a cure for it. And it helps other people heal. It helps us heal inside. The effects of smoke and products of combustion have a well-established measure of concern within the fire service. Historically, inhalation of smoke and hot gases has been realized to have an immediate effect on your ability to survive, and both short-term and long-term effects on your lungs and your ability to breathe. Cancers were not realized to impact the fire service in greater proportion than the general population, and the fire ground was not realized as a source of carcinogens. But the materials within occupancies and the products of combustion from today's fires are very different than those that the fire service of a generation ago fought. Today's fires have more in common with a hazardous materials event and contain high concentrations of potent carcinogens. Today's firefighter needs to be aware that the chemicals generated from these fires can not only enter the body through inhalation, but also by absorption through the skin and that absorption greatly increases with increased body temperature. This is revealed in recent studies that now directly associate firefighting with higher incidences of multiple forms of cancer than what's seen in the general population. In progressive departments, there have been changes made towards reducing exposures to cancer-causing agents. We don't sleep next to our off-gassing bunker gear anymore, and we've installed diesel exhaust removal systems in our fire stations. But we need to look to the fire ground to do a better job of managing cancer risks there. We need to wear our SCBA longer through overhaul operations. We need to clean our firefighting gear after every fire, not just those from which it's visibly contaminated. We need to remove our hoods promptly and use skin wipes to stem the continuing absorption of chemicals through the highly absorbent skin of our neck and jawline. And we need to shower and return to the station and put on a clean uniform to further reduce the absorption of contaminants and to reduce their transfer to our station living environments. Change is difficult, ever more so in the face of strong cultural traditions, but we have to do it. Our culture was forged in the fires our predecessors fought, and while they may not look different, our fires hold a much greater threat to our long-term health. Cancers that have origin in the products of combustion of materials in use today place today's firefighter and today's fire service in a new risk profile. We can't afford to ignore the magnitude of this impending fire service health catastrophe. We need to confront the truth that today's fire ground promotes cancer and that a cultural change will be needed to reduce cancers associated with firefighting. <laughs>